Thanks for staying, guys. Uh, so the, uh, the actors of the film, unfortunately, were two nights ago. So uh, it's just me, but I'll try to represent them the best I can. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, and thought-provoking film. I have two questions for you. One is, um, how were you able to film this without imparting to your young child actors what their characters were being trained to do um, and give them nightmares? And, and two, um, did Alexander do it at the end after you... <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first question was <coughs> with young actors given difficult subject matter, and did Alexander do it? Well, it's a funny one, because if you actually break down each scene by scene, a lot of the kids are just being kids. There's only a few select scenes, and most of them involve Alexander that are tougher. Um, and uh, I mean, we did a lot of things. We obviously had like child psychologists and stuff like that to make sure that they were um, understood the context of the scenes. But Jeremy, the, the main boy, was inc incredibly mature. More mature, more mature than myself or Vincent, in, in a weird way. So he was, uh, he not only understood the context of the scene, but he was, um, he had this amazing way of going in and out. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of kind of movie magic. It's not as bad as it seems on set, as it, as it feels in the movie, so... Um, there are obviously a few hairy moments uh, for, for him, um, but uh, generally I think um, he had a really good time on set. Um, for the ending, um, I mean, what you see is what you get, I guess. <laughs> for us, it was uh, the natural ending for the movie, the end of the story, the end, um, I guess, of the cycle. It starts with Alexander as a baby and ends on Tobias as a baby. and. Uh, for us, it was more Alexander's intention that was more important than uh, uh, any action that happened next. Thank you. Um, what were the accents of the um, colony? They weren't Australian. And, and why did they have accents? Speak of the accents or, and also the setting. Uh, from the start, we went to the idea was to kind of set this movie in nowhere land, kind of like the uh, fables that we read growing up, growing up um, maybe like in middle Europe. Um, so we tried to get a full hodgepodge of different accents of, and ethnicities. Um, so there's you know there's Ethiopian characters, there's Argentinian, Russian, Hungarian, um, and uh, that was in a way to try. Set this in kind of a nowhere land. Right here in front. Um, talk a little bit about your the process of casting all of these kids, and uh, were there any of them unknowns, or were they all uh, they have experience um, acting? Especially Alexander's eyes are just amazing. The question about casting, and particularly Alexander's eyes. <laughs> uh, so all the kids are uh, first timers. It's their first movie. And um, all the women, um, except for one. One had acted in a movie before, she was a, actually a director. But the rest were uh, first time actors. So we spree cast everyone, basically. Uh, so we basically we filmed uh, probably eighty five percent of the movie in Melbourne, Australia, and um, yeah, Melbourne. <laughs> and uh, we basically uh, we kind of took over a building, just like the character Gregory takes over a building, and uh, we designed it through his eyes, and uh, that's where most of the movie was shot. And then we uh, shot a few select uh, exterior scenes for the outside world in Georgia. The country, Georgia. Thank you. Uh, the metaphor of safety and, pr and pr having a community that is safe while doing criminal activity um, is not is something that we see around the world today, uh, with child soldiers, for example, or 
sometimes uh, Warren Jeffs in Utah. I'd just like to know what your intention is in, in creating this kind of fable, if you will, uh, about safety and criminality. Are you filming right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, just, uh, he's asking about the duality of the creating safety for the community in an unsafe and, and then creating violence. Criminality, yeah. So I guess um, create, writing a script and creating a story, we were kind of purely motivated by um, uh, not so much politics, but more the human drama at the core of the film. And uh, I personally find it uh, really interesting that a lot of Gregory's motivations in the film are very paternal. And um, providing safety for your kids and providing your kids everything you never had is a very universal and paternal thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this character is very warped. Um, so, um, there's no doubt that, um, unfortunately, uh, there are similar kind of um, <coughs> scenarios currently in the world. Um, and we were certainly aware of that, but it wasn't necessarily our motivation behind making the movie, if that makes sense. Well, then, then what is the, if that's not, if it's, if we step out of the politics of it and look at it anthropologically, if you will, why did you want to tell this story in this way? Um, Repeat the question first. Oh, uh, outside of politics, why did you want to tell this story? I guess um, the story initially was sparked from an article that we read about child assassins in Colombia. And there was something in that article about um, there these interviews with these kids who were shooting these people. And they, um, it really disturbed me, the lack of connection they had with um, their actions. And they're essentially doing what they did because the adults around them we're telling them to do so. So um, that sparked something in us. And right at the same time as I read that article, I also read a quote by one of my favorite filmmakers, Lewis Boonwell. And the quote was um, something along the lines of, he couldn't imagine anything more surreal than one person shooting another person. It was the most surreal image he could think of. And um, I guess just, Every film I've made in the past has been sparked by some sort of surreal image. And just that image of that a boy shooting down another mm -hmm. man um, because another, because his dad, or because um, and the adults around him told him to do so, um, kind of, uh, that was the spark. But it also kind of sparked off feelings for us like, why as a kid do we study mathematics? because our parents tell us that we should. And it just kind of felt like a, um, a really extreme kind of metaphor for um, the relationship between parents, or adults and children, and the sadness of when children are not allowed to see the world through clear and optimistic eyes. Mm -hmm. Given the rather dark and disturbing nature of the film, how, how did you get financing? <laughs> Where did the money come from? Who made money for this film? I guess if we're lucky, there's a few dark, twisted people with money out there. <laughs> 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 I guess Gregory put it there for me as uh, 
as a sign of a, a femininity that he's protecting, or maybe a mother that he never had. Um, and in the film, he's protecting single mothers. And that fountain is, a, I guess, a symbol of that. And the only time he becomes sexual with anyone in the film is with that fountain. <laughs> Uh, could you talk about when Vincent Cassell became involved in the project and were there specific cinematic or literary references that you used in the development of the project? Um, specific casting of Vincent Cassell and specific literary references? So with the literary references, um, I guess once we started writing it, we noticed similarities um, to stories like the Pied Piper, who uh, I'm not sure if you know Cass sort of it. he lures these kids out to a cave and um, we kind of always pictured that our story starts once they're in the cave. And it's this angry man kind of teaching um, these kids um, to hate this town as much as he does. Um, and there are other kind of fables that we had as references like uh, Bluebeard and his nine wives and uh, um, things like that. But um, with Vincent, uh, he came on uh, pretty late in the process, actually. And uh, I mean, guys like Vincent Cassell have teams around him to protect him from people like me. You know, <laughs> first time for makers. Uh, it's great. So it takes a while to get through to them, but once you do, luckily, he uh, really fell in love with the role. And um, you know, I don't know if I was just lucky, but he was, uh, he flew down to Australia and he just kind of gave himself to the project and, you know, he was surrounded by first-time actors, kids, and he, uh, he was kind of the king on set and he took over, which is pretty cool to watch. Uh, I'm assuming that you used the Pied Piper as the karaoke songs, those were how can we get those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the, I guess once we uh, knew those karaoke scenes were going to be there, it felt wrong to have songs that already existed. So, yeah, as part of creating this Nowhere Land, we created these number one pop songs from scratch. So, the duet sung by Alexander and Ariana is a song by Metronomy, the UK band. Sebastian Tellier, French artist, created Grigori's song. And Jarvis Cocker from UK created uh, Friday Night. Um, and I really do hope they can release them. They've all got music videos too, which is pretty rad. <laughs> 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 Just a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. Now, uh, two questions. Number one, any significance to names Alexander and Grigori? Not the most common Australian names. There's a Russian connection there. Second question, why move across the continent to Georgia? You have a scene, there's plenty of mountains and other things in Australia. What is the connection with Georgia? I mean, there's no ethnic reason for the, for the uh, names Alexander and Gore. We just kind of just felt they were really strong, timeless kind of mythic names and serve the characters. Um, with Georgia, I, um, my, my parents grew up in Ukraine and uh, my mum would travel to Georgia because we had an auntie there and she, I grew up in Australia but she always told me these stories about Georgia, this beautiful place they went for, for um, their summer holidays. So uh, in 2010 when I was travelling in Europe I wanted to go somewhere different so I went to Georgia I was right at the start of writing this film and I fell in love with the country and lands the landscapes had this kind of mythic quality that I was looking for in the, uh, in the film. So from that point on, it instantly became kind of the world of the movie. <coughs> so you obviously made the choice not to do a lot of explaining. I wondered whether there were drafts along the way where you had explained more and how you decided what to leave out. Um, I'm trying to think back to previous drafts. Um, for, for me, the, the most important part was telling this story from the emotional perspective of Alexander. And um, 
in terms of explaining things, I wanted to understand things from his perspective. And I felt from outside of that perspective, um, we're not as important for, for, for this story. I think your perception is correct. Um, I mean, unfortunately, this is a harsh reality that things like this actually happen in the world, and the story that this is based on is based on reality where single mothers are, know that their kids are shooting people and accept it as a way of life and a way of survival. Um, so without going into it too much and explaining, like, or telling you how to feel about the characters, that's, that's the best way I can explain it. Who were the people that Alexander killed? Never really explained the, their connection to Gregory or any of the other characters. Or, yeah, or um, Uncle Charlie. What was Uncle Charlie? What was the connection and, and the, the targets? Uh, the most important thing about Uncle Charlie is that he gives Gregory money and he gives him targets. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all we need to know who those people are. There's someone's put a hit on them and they're... Um, that's all the, the movie uh, kind of says about that. Mm -hmm. goes to the uh, chicken scene and there were two moments. There was one, uh, I guess I didn't tell Vincent how to behave or how to sit, but for some reason he took his plate of food and he sat down against this post mm -hmm. and uh, where the camera was already positioned, it was kind of shooting down at his crotch. I don't remember that shot. It was the most animalistic kind of uh, imposing uh, kind of gorilla-like position. Um, I was really surprised <laughs> that he kind of kneeled down like that because it looked really uncomfortable. Um, I felt like that his physicality kind of was uh, so perfect. And the other moment was uh, when Gregory then is telling everyone about Leo's disappearance. And um, at the end of the scene, uh, Alexander kind of, um, I guess, notices a lie and he gets um, upset. And um, we were in a big rush that day, and I, I remember not telling Jeremy anything. I just um, 
we were kind of setting everything up. And I just felt like we should just go for a take just to start rolling. And on that first take, um, as Vincent was telling me this story, Jeremy just completely on his own just started to cry. And um, that's the scene, that's the take that's in the, in the final film. I remember us all being pretty floored by that. That was the first take, yeah. Thank you so much.